Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Dean Clayton and welcome to Smack Stember 2022. Uh, today's session, as you can see by the slide that we're sharing uh, just here, uh, is all about getting started with Smacks. Uh, and this is really part of a series of uh, video content we're going to produce to kind of, uh, should we say, take you on that journey to get started. But don't worry, you haven't got to listen to me on this one. Uh, I've got my uh, well uh, best colleagues, uh, Pete and Carl, who are going to go through all this uh, with you today. Um, I guess the best thing to do is if I hand over to them, let them introduce themselves uh, and then go from there. So, Pete, Carl, it's over to you. Hi, I'm Pete, and I'd like to invite you to join my coworker Carl and I as we get to know a little more about Smacks. We're moving over from another product, so I need to get Carl up to speed on what exactly Smacks is and how it might be a little different than what we were used to before. I mean, how hard can it be, right? That's the right attitude. Yeah, we'll take things one step at a time and try to simplify them. We'll start by looking at services and the service catalog and continue on from there. So please, join us as we explore all that Smacks has to offer and maybe we can all learn something along the way. And we'll try to make sure to use easy-to-understand examples that aren't completely boring. Are you saying there are people out there that find IT service management boring? Amazing, I know, but it's true. Anyway, I hope we can keep everyone engaged and enthralled as we take a look at what's involved with getting started with Smacks. Thanks for joining us. I hear I need to get onboarded with Smack so my team can work customer incidents. Can you make me a category and incident so we can use it? Now, hold on. Smacks is a little different than what you're probably used to. What we need to do is define your services so your end users can make requests. Will you handle the incident separately? My services? What are they? Well, ITIL says they're a means of delivering value to customers by facilitating outcomes customers want to achieve without the ownership of specific costs and risks. But what that really boils down to is giving your customers what they need to do their jobs. So what services are you providing your end users? We fix incidents that get assigned to us. Oh, okay. Well, maybe we can take a look at one of these incidents and see how we can make the process easier. What's one kind of incident you end up responding to often? Well, one common incident we have is I, I need to add users to our Pulse VPN service. So nothing's broken. No, it, no, nothing's broken. And the Pulse system is still working for everybody? Yes, we just need to add the new users to it. How does the incident get handled? Well, we usually just add the user's ID to our Active Directory, and then we send them an email with a link to where you download the software from. Okay, so this is something that you do often, and it runs pretty much the same way every time. You offer this to your customers as part of your VPN service, right? Yes, if you put it that way. Well, that really doesn't sound like an incident. Okay, I know what you're getting at. No, it's not an incident, but that's where the help desk puts everything, right? And that's who the end user is going to call first, right? Well, wouldn't it be easier if your customers had a place to find all of those offerings? Then they could just find what they're looking for without even calling the service desk? The service what? Oh, bear with me here. Okay. Let's take this example into Smacks and see how it looks inside request management. Okay. So when our end user wants something, the first thing they will do is log into the service portal. Okay, we'll log in with our Franklin user. And once the user logs in, they'll be presented with uh, a screen that shows a lot of the options that they can look into. Uh, we've kind of taken the service catalog and broken it, broken it down by category. But really the way Smacks works best is if they just tell us what they're looking for. So they can go right in to the search box okay. and type exactly what they want. So what are they looking for? I need corporate VPN access. And so you can see as they're typing, the system is already looking for things. And it actually found the service offering that looks pretty good right now, request access to the corporate VPN. But before we do that, I want to take a look at some of the other things that Smacks is looking for. So if you'll just hit enter and we'll do a search. 
So you can see the first thing that it does find, and it's a pretty good search, is request access to the corporate VPN offering. So an offering is just one of the things that you provide as part of your overall service. But you'll also notice that it looked up uh, an open service request we might already have. We've got knowledge articles about connecting to the corporate network. Uh, so it's searching the entire system for things that might be relevant to this user. In this case, let's go ahead and look at the service offering for requesting access to the corporate VPN. So I just click right here. Yep, you can request it. Now, one of the problems that we talked about earlier is that when someone calls into your help desk and asks for this information or asks to have this done, the help desk doesn't always know what to look for or what to ask for that you'll need to, to provide the service in the end, end. So you can see here that this offering, first of all, has a description of everything that is part of this offering. So they can see that they're going to need a company login and password. North American users are going to use Pulse. Uh, they're going to have to specify the operating system. So all that information that we're looking for is there. Now, more than that, if you scroll down a little bit, um, after they enter their business justification, and you can see it actually took exactly what they typed in for their search, they can add to it if they'd like. Okay. Um, on the bottom there are specific fields that we put as part of this offering that the user's going to need to enter to get the, to get the service they need. So the first thing they have is that connection information. And let's go ahead and select the uh, USA there. USA. And you saw based on our description that USA will always be using Pulse VPN, so we have our rules automatically populate for the user. So all they need to finish up now is the operating system type. So I'm on Windows. And then they can just go ahead and submit uh, submit the request to the system. All right, or I can add an attachment. Yep, they could add attachments if there's some screenshots they need or other things they can put right in. But in this case, everything's here. We submit, and you can see that request was successfully created. Okay, now that the end user has created the request, let's take a look at how that looks for an agent. An agent? What's an agent? Well, an agent is an IT employee that uses the primary SMAX interface to support IT services. They might work on service requests, incidents, changes, or one of many other areas. What's an end user then? Well, an end user is someone who uses the portal to create and follow up on requests they make regarding the services that IT provides. Uh, look at it this way. If Smax was a coffee shop, the agents are working behind the counter while the end users are ordering the drinks. Oh, I understand. So if we take a look at our agent interface we have here, there's the request that was just created. Let's go ahead and take a look at that one. Okay, so I just click on this. Yep. So this is all the information that the request involves, and so we don't have to go through all of it right now. We want to take a look at a couple things. Let's take a look at the workflow. Workflow. Oh, so I click here. Yeah. So you're going to see this is the overall workflow of the request, and you'll see right now we're in the approval phase, waiting for an approval to move forward. And if we take a look down at the approvals tab, you'll see the, all the approvals that have been defined for this request. Oh, down here. And, yep. And again, these were created by, by our service uh, service offering that we created for the VPN. So we're waiting for VPN approval. Now, the person waiting this for approval doesn't actually have to get into the request to do it. They can actually just go to their approval approval queue. Let's take a look at that. Okay. So, uh... All right. So we can see this is the approval for our request. We can see on the right there all the details from the service request that the approver is going to need. And if you scroll that oh. uh, preview all the way to the bottom. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're going to see those fields that we added. And our user are options specifically for this. So he can see the connection information. He can see the operating system type. And he can actually see the user's email. And if you remember, that's not something we entered. It's just something that was uh, generated by the system based on who was, who was uh, making the request. So again, can go into the request if we need, but all the information is right here. So if they scroll back up, they can go ahead and approve this, and we can move on in our workflow. So just click on approve. Oh, and I need to write a comment. If you have an option to do a comment. If you were to deny, to deny this, you would definitely have to put a comment based on the out-of-box rules. Oops, I typed wrong. I approve it. And I click save. Yep, go ahead and save. And really, that's all the approver needs to do. So while we don't need to go into the request, let's go back to it real quick and take a look at what happened. Requests. No. So if we do a quick refresh here to pick up the latest changes and we go back in those approvals, you'll see that it has been approved. And this is a very simple approval, but you can actually have quite complex approval chains, but it allows you to keep an eye on exactly what's going on and who's waiting for approvals and, and 
everything needed uh, related to the approval process. Now, if we go take a look at the workflow, you'll see that the request itself has moved into the fulfillment phase, which is where your team is going to go do the work they need to do. For that, let's take a look at the task plan. Okay, we'll look at the task plan. Oh, no, nope, the task plan. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, a task plan here. Gotcha. And you're going to see that there's two tasks that we created as part of our offering. We need to add the user to uh, to the VPN access group and, and Active Directory. And that's something right now we're doing manually. Uh, and then the second task is actually automated. We're going to actually edit the solution of the request automatically, add an install link, set the completion code, and get the information back to the end user. Long term, we could actually uh, uh, automate both of these tasks. You could use uh, a automation tool such as operations orchestration to add the user automatically to the AD group, but right now it's, uh, it's a, a manual task. So let's take a look at how someone would handle that. Again, they could log into here, but they don't have to. So let's take a look at the task queue. And we'll refresh. Oh, there was one. Yep, and you'll see we've got the work here. Uh, again, on the right, we can actually do it all from this screen. Um, but if we scroll all the way down, you'll see we have all that information that they'll need for the user options. So the person doing this has the, the email they need. They have the location, the VPN type. Everything can be uh, accessed right here. So they can go in and uh, edit any information, add some details. But in this case, let's just say the work is done, and we're going to validate it. No, validate it. Validate it. Oh, and they can put in. A so here they can actually put in any kind of extra description they'd like. But the important part is their completion summary, what they did, how they finished the task, uh, and that that will get. Uh, so I added. Whoops, available. I added the user. And then I click save. Yep. Once they save that task, you'll see that it's now finished. It is completed. And we can go back and... Oh, and I see a running task. Yep. You'll actually see a task since we have all tasks here. Once that task was completed, the automated task kicked off. Oh. Okay. And let's see what happened there. Let's go back to the request. Back to the request. And let's do a quick refresh. And you'll see in the task queue now, both tasks are completed. The one that we manually entered and the, the automated task finished. And what that did, if we go take a look at the workflow. Oops, to the workflow. Um, you'll see that now it's automatically moved forward to the acceptance phase. So our work is done. The work has been fulfilled. And now it's sent back to the end user for acceptance. Okay. Can I see what the automatic task did? Sure. If you take a look down at the resolution, oh. you'll see that it entered a resolution and it has a link to the self-service portal with the in installation instructions for Pulse, which is the VPN tool. And it set the completion code that we fulfilled it offline. We were talking to the user at the time. Uh, and everything's pretty good. Okay. So let's go back and take a look at what it looks like for the end user now. We can see that there's something requiring an action. And we can see our service request is ready to be accepted or rejected. So if we already know what's going on because we got an email, everything's good, we could accept it or reject it right from here. But let's go ahead and take a look at what really oh, the whole thing that came back. So if you'll go to your requests. Oh, this button. Yeah. You know, here's here's our one request. Now we can see it's in the validation phase, so it's waiting for us. Oh, and I can click here. Yeah, you take a look at the details, and if we look down uh, at the bottom for the the resolution and any updates, we can see. Please follow the installation instructions located here to oh. install and configure Pulse. So it's waiting for me now to go do my work. And if okay. I click, uh, it's taking me to a. Uh, knowledge article, again, inside the portal with all the information to install and connect to the company VPN using Pulse, okay. including a download link to install the software. So again, everything I need to do the work as the end user is here. I don't need to talk to the service desk directly. Uh, if there isn't a problem, if I go take a look at my request, if I had gone through all my work and there was still something I needed to do. I could enter a comment and reject the solution saying there's more and it goes back to the service desk. But in this case, I did it. Everything looks good. I couldn't write a comment if I need to, but I can also then just accept that my service request has been completed successfully. This button right here. And that's it. The request gets closed out. The service desk does not need to do anything in this case. And what we looked at is a, a service offering from beginning to end. Makes sense? Yes. All right. Now, what happens if it's a different thing? What if it's a service that's not working right? 
or I don't ah, have access okay. to something. So when we're looking at things that are not already defined as a service offering, we have something for that called support offerings. But why don't we take a little break, grab some coffee, we'll come back and we'll take a look at one of those. Okay. So one thing I've noticed is when I'm looking at all of my offerings, some of them are called support offerings, while others are called service offerings, and I don't know the difference between them. A service offering is a predefined collection of goods and or services that an end user can select when they know what they need. This usually results in a specific action taken with respect to the overall service you're providing, like when the end user requested to be added to the corporate VPN earlier. We knew what approvals were needed and what tasks had to be completed in order to provide this piece of the service to the consumer. When this happens, it results in a service request being created in SMAX. A support offering deals with more unstructured requests or questions around our service. There aren't going to be any approvals to find, and most likely there won't be any tasks either, although for some issues in certain areas, the support offering could define some tasks around troubleshooting. But these type of, of Offerings might re include requests for information that need to be researched or looked up in a knowledge base that isn't available to the end user, uh, complaints about the service or a specific component of the service, or it could involve reports around degradation of the service that may or may not be caused by something in our environment. This last example could even result in an incident being created against our service. But when these happen, the system creates a support request. Incident? You just mentioned incident. What's an incident? Who works on those? So an incident is recorded when there's an unplanned interruption to or degradation in quality of the service we're providing. If we were back in our hypothetical coffee shop and a customer told us the coffee tasted terrible, that would be our support request. The customer wants their coffee to taste good. Now, if the barista, our service desk agent, figures out that the customer poured salt in the coffee instead of sugar, they could take care of that without the need for an incident. We were still providing good coffee after all. But if they found that the filter was clogged in the coffee machine, then they would create an incident for someone to fix the machine itself. In this case, there's an issue with the service we are providing that resulted in a degradation of quality. Once that incident is created, if any other customers complain about their coffee, we can simply link their support request directly to the incident. In fact, SMAX will suggest possibly the related incidents to the agent when they review the customer's support request. Once the coffee machine is fixed and the incident is resolved, each customer is notified of the resolution and can accept or reject the solution, just like in a service request. Let's take a look at the support request process and how it may or may not lead to an incident inside of SMAX. To go into the portal and, and put in your search for what you're having problems with. Oh, well, I'm just going to put, I'm having VPN connectivity issues. Yeah, and again, the system is going to provide some little help there, but if you do a full search, you're going to see quite a bit of information here. Uh, the first being any kind of news that might be associated with this. And you can see there's actually a problem out there that's most likely causing your issue. But we're going to pretend that's not there. Uh, and let's go ahead and look at the next one, which is the support offering for VPN connectivity issues. So it seems like a good one for you to choose. And quick request. And you can see here we've got a little bit of information about this kind, including a link to any troubleshooting. So there's a, actually an article inside the system already to help you troubleshoot these problems. Again, we'll pretend that that didn't help, and we'll go ahead and turn this into a support request with our service desk. So you can fill in your description. Again, probably want a little more than that in a real one, but uh, brings in what you put uh, in your search. Uh, I will add, I'm getting access denied when I click connect. Yeah. And one thing that's interesting, you could even, if you had a screenshot of the error message, you could paste it in. Uh, service or Max will figure out what the text is and put it in for you. Okay. Uh, but next, you've got how is this issue affecting you? So you can kind of tell the service desk how important this is to you. Can you continue to work? Are you completely blocked from you doing your job, or is this kind of in between? Well, in this case, I can't do my job. Yeah. You put in how how you want to be contacted, either email or other responses you have. Well, you can leave it there. And again, you'll notice this is very similar to the information we have when requesting the VPN connectivity. We need to know what kind of, where your location is, what VPN type, and your operating system. Oh, and I'm running Windows. And if you had any other kind of attachments like logs, you could put those in as well. Okay. But in this case, we'll go ahead and submit it. And what's happening here is 
you now have a support request open, and you'll see the number there. So let's take a look at what the agent sees when they're working on the support request. Here we can see their queue of the requests that they need to work on. You can see the details over on the right. But if we click on it, we'll get a full view of the support request itself. We have all the information here. They can add comments. They can add to the description, whatever they need to do. North American domain using Pulse. I'll save that. So that's all you need to do to update the request. So one of the interesting things that we have for our agents, if you look in the resolution section, oh, you see a little pop-up tab with suggested solutions. When you click on that, it takes a look at the uh, int what's entered in the description and the rest of the, the request and looks for possibly related uh, incidents or support requests or articles that might help with the agent to, to solve the user's issue. Oh, I see another support request with the same description. Yeah, and right below it, we see an incident that may or may not have something to do with this the problem that the user's having. So before we go into this in detail, I wanna look at the request in a slightly different view. You look up top, you'll see a live support option. So this is a, a different way an agent can work a ticket, and it's actually built for CTI systems when the call's coming directly into the, uh, into the agent's queue. But in this case, it's nice to work with, work with if you have the user on the phone as you're talking to them, all the information is put in a slightly more streamlined view. Uh, and one thing up at the top, you'll see all these colored icons for possibly suggested solutions or incidents or offerings, articles that might help with the resolution. So if we take a look at the recent incidents, Right up top, we're going to see that the North American Domain Services database is down, and it's actually affecting Pulse VPN. So in this case, after especially after talking to the uh, end user and doing some research, we're pretty sure that this is the problem. And once this is taken care of, they'll be able to connect. What we can do then is link this incident as related. And now the request itself, we really don't have to worry about anymore until the incident's completed. Once it is completed, the resolution will be copied into the support request, the user will be notified, and they'll have the ability to accept or reject the solution just like a service request. Why does it matter whether it's a request or an incident? Well, who addresses the issue for one? The service desk can usually handle customer-related issues, that's what they're trained for, but issues with the infrastructure need to go to another more specialized team. Then there's the SLAs. We have service level agreements with our customers relating to how long it takes us to respond to them or fix their issues. And these are connected to the requests. We have other agreements relating to the uptime of our services or how long a team has to fix the backend issues. These are attached to the incidents. Uh, it also keeps a boundary between the service consumers, which are end users, and the service providers, our IT department, or even an external company. We don't need the end users seeing all of our behind the scenes work or, or panic for that matter. And then even more, it helps with reporting. We can report against requests to see the number of times an issue affected our customers, or we can use the analytics features in SMAX to look for possible service offerings or knowledge articles that could be created to reduce the number of support requests. At the same time, we can report on incidents to see the actual number of times something broke in our environment, or use the same analytics features to find patterns that could result in problems being created against our service. Problems? What are problems? Well, we'll get to those eventually, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. One more thing about support requests. We want to minimize the number coming into the service desk. We can do this by analyzing the support requests that are coming in and then determining what we can do to keep the same ones from getting entered again. We might find that there's some additional service offerings that we need to define, or we might need to create knowledge articles to educate our end users. Either way, the next time a similar request comes in, we either have that mapped out as a service offering workflow or the end user might find their answer in the knowledge base and not even enter a new request. Nice, right? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Hey, just out of curiosity though, how does service requests fit into the coffee shop concept? Service requests are simply the result of the customer ordering off the menu, our menu of service offerings in this case, which we call the service catalog. The service what? <laughs> well, tell you what, speaking of coffee, let's go have another one and then we can talk about the service catalog. OK, 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pete and Carl. That was absolutely fantastic introduction that you've done there. Uh, we'll switch to uh, Q&A now. We had a few questions which we've uh, answered that have came through. Uh, and a couple of things, obviously, more quite generically around SMACs and capabilities in SMACs. And what, what I will say is in tomorrow's session uh, that we're doing, where we're focusing on uh, request management, uh, we will do a little bit of an overall introduction to SMACs, maybe for some of you where it's your first opportunity to uh, look at the product as part of this overall or, or overall event. Um, but just looking through the couple of questions that have come through, if there's anything else that makes sense for us to answer, um, nothing jumps out other than what we've answered uh, in the uh, Q&A live. Um, there are a couple of other questions which we'll pick up uh, offline and we'll look to either incorporate in uh, either tomorrow's session uh, or we'll answer via the SMACS uh, platform, uh, uh, SMACS portal platform that we've got. Okay, so let's move on. A uh, couple of reminders uh, with the way that we're running, obviously, SMACS Timber. So uh, as ever, we have our SMACS app challenge still uh, available for anyone to enter. Um, as we state, there are no skills required if you are new to SMACS, even if you are new to SMACS, this is an ideal opportunity to get hands on, have a play, build something that maybe even could be useful within your organization, or do something a little bit different uh, and a little bit fun, a little bit fun. Um, we do have, as part of our uh, webinar portal uh, catalog, uh, if you look under the category which is labelled as Smack September 21, uh, we've got the Builder Smack app webinar series. So it was a six-part series that walks through six main steps of building out a, a Smack Studio app. You don't have to watch all of them. Uh, in fact, the first one gives a good high-level overview of kind of what you're in for. Definitely recommend you looking at that. And also, if you're new to Smacks and all and want to understand how our Colas configuration works, uh, or maybe you know trying to understand how how uh, business rules work and and things like how we do some of the special drop downs and that kind of thing, have a look at that. It gives you a good introductory as part of it. But we will be covering a little bit of that uh, this week with some of our live sessions and then some of the on demand content that comes out later uh, during the month. Um, I'd also like to point out as part of that, there are two sessions which we refer to as the SMACS best practices. Uh, one best practices overall and one related to catalog content. Both really good sessions uh, to, into more of a deep dive when you're starting to think about it in a, in a more, should we say, production ready type setup rather than just quickly putting a, 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 a POC of an app, should we say. Um, and they're all obviously fairly easy. So that's main SMACS app challenge competition. Uh, you can enter as many times as you like across the three categories that we've got. So just to remember and repeat that, we've got our creating catalog content. So similar to what you've just seen uh, with the VPN uh, access uh, support, uh, service offering, and uh, support offerings, you've got that as a, as a good starting point. Um, we then, and that's really good way of getting an introduction to the way our code list works and building out some simple business rules. Um, on top of that, uh, we then have update an existing app that's available from our item marketplace. Uh, we put the link in, which should be click clickable as part of the video. Um, the item marketplace is where we have a lot of extra content related to Smacks uh, and, the, and the Smacks uh, product set. Um, so there are uh, there's a section which is labelled up as uh, Smack Studio apps, which you can kind of dive into, or, or on the link that we've shared uh, to to look at all the items there. Um, but you can download one of those apps. You can then easily upload that package into a Smack trial tenant, uh, of which you can obviously request one from us uh, during this event, um, and then start to modify it. And the documentation with those is really straightforward, and there's some good. Uh, guides as part of that of how to build out some catalog content for some of them uh, out of the box. So feel free to do that and have a go uh, at that option. Um, and then of course, there's the full blown build your own Smack Studio app where, you know, even if maybe, you know, you've just watched that webinar series, you'll see, it'll give you a good overview to go and do it. And maybe even build the app that's part of that studio series and just modify it slightly for, for how you feel like it would be used within your organization. Um, as we said, trial tenants are available. You just need to ask for one via the Smacks member Smacks portal. 
Uh, we're also, we uh, only request that we have to enter the competition is to basically uh, submit your app by the 23rd. Again, that's all done through the Smacks Timber Smacks portal. So on the portal, there's a title that says Smacks App Challenge. If you go in there, there is a service offering to register interest in the Smacks App Challenge. Okay, so do that, put some basic details in, and then work on your app and then come back uh, and upload that as part of that plan. And as we said, if you get your submission in by the 23rd, uh, we'll put you forward for potentially one of the awards that will be announced on the 30th. Um, if it's later than that, we can't guarantee that you'll be in the uh, up for consideration because we do tend to expect to have quite a number of apps uh, and um, catalog content that's been, or updated apps as part of uh, this challenge. I mean, just like last year, we had a significant number uh, and it takes a while for us to obviously go through that reviews uh, of what's been put through. So uh, please obviously make sure you try and do that um, before that date. But yeah, that's the Smacks app challenge. I look forward to seeing you competing as part of that. Okay, uh, as a gentle reminder, if you have any issues uh, with your trial tenants, uh, we do have a support request option uh, in the Smacks Timber Smacks portal where you can put a bit more technical details if there's a particular issue with that. Or alternatively, uh, you can contact us at smackstember at microfocus.com. And that also includes if you've got any other queries or feedback or potential issues with accessing either of the sessions or the Smacks Timber Smacks portal. We had a few people today uh, reach out that they registered uh, obviously before early last week. Uh, they got the email to activate, uh, to, to access the Smacks portal, but it's not working. Um, as we kind of sort of made in, said in the documentation and the uh, what's on the webinar sessions uh, uh, page, access to the Smacks portal tab. Um, those links only last for about three days. Uh, it's a security measure within Smacks to make sure that it's not shared out or, or lost. Um, so if you do need us to reset, you know, resend that, just drop us an email at smackstember at microfocus.com and we can trigger that for you and you can be in within minutes. Okay, um, then moving on. Uh, so next up, uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, uh, and hopefully I've got the times right for uh, my American coll uh, colleagues who are obviously uh, having Labor Day today. Uh, so tomorrow is our focus on request management. Uh, what does that mean? Well, whereas today, Carl and Pete have gone through with sort of the getting started and understanding some of the basic concepts and ways of working as Max, we're going to look at it more, should we say, from a implementation point of view, a technical setup of how that module works out of the box. So we're going to look at request records. We're going to look at how that record is set up, some of the out-of-the-box rules that are in there, how the workflow is set up, the different types of requests, which obviously have been alluded to with the service and support requests you've seen today. Um, and then we're going to broaden that out a little bit. And again, this light like today session is kind of like a starter, uh, a bit of a taster, should we say, some additional content that we're hoping to produce as part of this month. Uh, and beyond Smacks Tembo as well as part of our overall plans for enablement. So look forward to that. You'll have to put it with me. I will be presenting that session tomorrow. Uh, so that's 5 p.m. to 5.30, same time as today, Central European time. And again, same time again for uh, anyone else around the world. Um, and hopefully, if I've got it right, it is 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, uh, PDT uh, tomorrow. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to again thank you uh, for joining us on our, on our Merry Smacks Timber journey. I hope you found today's session really informative. Uh, look at look out for additional content uh, from Carl and Pete uh, on demand uh, throughout the month. Uh, and we'll notify you on these live sessions as when some of that gets added on as well. Uh, but again, thank you all, and we'll see you next time.